Uh, hi, I'm Guillaume from University of Montreal. And uh, yeah, one of our teachers uh, co-written a book with uh, Demsky that just came out. I, want, I haven't seen it or read it, but I was assuming that maybe you were... Uh, What's your school? University of Montreal. The, the co-author was uh, Mario Beauregard. Have you heard? It's uh, spell something about neuroscience. Yes. What, so, spell the last yeah. name? Uh, Beauregard, that's uh, B-E-A-U-R... Beauregard? You know, Beauregard. Yeah, Mario. Yeah, I know that name because, you know, my ancestors were the ones that the Brits ran out of that part of the world. Um, and, and we have the name Beauregard. Um, and Beauregard is the co-author who wrote a book with Dembski? Yeah. Um, I don't know that one, but I do know that Dembski uh, made a tour of Canadian universities a few years ago cultivating supporters. One of them is at McMaster. Do you have a McMaster school up there? Yeah, they, they have made uh, efforts to cultivate Canadian followers. Um, so your, I'm sorry, your question then? Well, I, I wanted to know if you had uh, read or seen this book, because lately I was doing a, a minor in cognitive science. I, I started to notice that more and more teachers in the psychology field have been uh, talking using uh, the ID lingo, uh, you know, oh, really? that, that kind of expressions. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that Dembski is really high on is, is, is the ID. Well, they're, they're defending just traditional dualism, that the mind is separate from the body. And I think that's why they're attracted to neuroscience and they're trying to get some neuroscientists, you know, to, to come in with them to argue for this type of dualism. Because they regard Darwin as responsible for turning society into the, you know, the materialistic culture that has undermined the whole idea of the belief in the, in the soul and therefore the, the immortality of the soul. I'm not familiar with that book, but I do, I do know that they are cultivating supporters in that in that area of science, but I'm sorry I can't talk about that book. But 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 they are doing that. So I'm sorry I don't know that one. The book is about dualism, actually. So, uh, but <laughs> but but they are they are um, cultivating supporters in universities. They probably have supporters in every university in the, on the continent. Um, uh, not that they're numerous and it's not a tidal wave of support, but they are there. And they're working this material into some of their classes, especially honor seminars, freshman seminars, which are outside the core curriculum. So ID is being taught in some universities. Thank you. Maybe you're one of my, my, my cousins or something, you know. From, you sound like you could be. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious. We all agree that ID shouldn't be taught in biology, but my question is, should biologists teach about ID. In other words, um, a lot of these arguments, these key words that they bring up, you know, they say it violates thermodynamics, entropy, fine-tuning of the numbers of the universe, uh, the Kalam cosmological argument. All these things aren't taught in biology classrooms. So even somebody who takes valid biology, when a Christian comes up and says, you know, but what about all this? And, and I learned all this stuff from my pastor that is masqueraded as science. You know, I still can't, I'm not really prepared to answer that. So should biology teachers, are they now forced to teach about the ID arguments in order to fend off? That question comes up all the time, and my answer is no. Um, the problems that young people are, are bringing, the, the questions that they're bringing into these, uh, whether it's a high school class or a college class, uh, were not generated by the biology teacher. It was gener these kids are being put in this position by their parents and their pastors, their religious advisors. And it's, it's those people's responsibility to work out the difficulties that they've created for these kids. Um, teaching science is, is, is hard enough without having to ask scientists to become philosophers of religion and theologians. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not helpful to try to, to put that task on their shoulders. Not that they should not be informed about it, because they darn well should, and they should be helping us more than they are. The scientific community should be helping. Um, some are, but most are not. Uh, they should be able to speak knowledgeably about it uh, in some context other than the formal presentation of their subject matter, certainly. But, um, and sometimes people ask me, uh, so no, it shouldn't be taught in their, in their science classes. Now, I do sometimes cover it in my uh, History of Western Thought class, but I do so very overtly critical of it, uh, because I want my students to understand that this is not anything that, that is established by good scholarship. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Um, and, but as far as teaching it, some people suggest it should be taught, you know, it's okay to teach it uh, to, to kids at the secondary level in a social studies class or in a comparative religion class. But, but in any class, if you go in and you tell kids here that, that intelligent design is science, that is false. Uh, and to tell kids that is to lie to them. Uh, not only that, 
So, so, you know, you can violate the Constitution in a, in a sociology class or a social science class just as you can in a science class. But I don't know how many of you have read their stuff carefully, but it is so dishonest. Their scholarship, it's, first of all, it's very poor, and it's also very dishonest. And if you're going to teach anything in a comparative religion class, you want the very best scholarship. You don't want to waste time with that kind of drivel. Uh, that, it's going to be very easy for them to get that elsewhere. Uh, they can get it in their youth ministries and stuff like that. But um, I have no sympathy for teaching it as a respectable um, area of study. I have, I do cover it in some of my classes, but only in such a way as to to uh, to critique it, uh, and only with my graduate students and in a special class I taught um, on the history and principles of evolution. But not not as good scholarship, and certainly not as science. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Elliot Reedman. I'm a law student at uh, DePaul University, um, and I wanted to DePaul or DePaul? Uh, DePaul in De Chicago with an L. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, could you explain why uh, the Dover case didn't um, reach the Supreme Court? And as a kind of a replaying of the Scopes trial, um, what would you consider uh, or, or foresee as uh, a possible judicial step for the intelligent design movement in the future if they did want to try to take the, the case to the Supreme Court. And additionally, how would you speculate, uh, based on the, the makeup of the current Supreme Court, how, how they might find? Whoa, you gave me a whole string of stuff to answer. Sorry, this uh, just, okay. too many um, questions. For, okay, you might have to remind me what they all are. Uh, for, first of all, uh, this, the, the, the Discovery Institute has really wanted a court case for a very long time. They published their legal strategy in the Utah Law Review in, in uh, July 2000. So they really have been itching for a court case because they want to, you know, they think they can really win. But they wanted it in an area where they, which was a very conservative, they've been shopping for districts, you know, judicial districts. And they thought either um, Kansas or Ohio would be just ideal. And that so far they have not got a lawsuit out of either one of those places. So it came out of left field at them in Dover which was the Middle District of Pennsylvania. It's on the Third Circuit. Um, and so it, it, Judge Jones's ruling only applies in the Middle District of Pennsylvania, only there, uh, technically. But it is so well written. It's so thorough. It's so comprehensive. It, it, one woman called it judicial poetry, which it is. It, it is really, it's, it, this case was much more like the McLean case in Arkansas in 1981, much more like it than it was like the Scopes case. Um, and the McLean case only went to the federal district court level, and it's had a very powerful effect on other judges ever since because Judge Overton in that case uh, went through the, 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 the characteristics, characteristics of science, you know, and spelled it out, you know, what a discipline has to do to meet, to qualify as science. So even though that was not a Supreme Court decision, McLean versus Arkansas, it's had a very, very, it is an integral part of the legal precedent. Uh, but now, so Judge Jones's decision is like that one. Now, the reason it was not appealed was because by the time he handed down his decision, the new school board had been in office now for about a month. There was a school board election on November 8th, which was about four days after the trial ended. And all of the creationists, there were eight seats of nine that were up for grabs, and all eight went to pro-science people. It was close, but all of the creationists were just wiped right out of office. Um, and so the new board certainly was not unhappy with the ruling and had no intention of, of not only of, of appealing it, but uh, of a, incurring any further legal costs for the system. Now, I think I even remember your last question. It was about the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, that makes me feel good since I'll be 55 later this month. Um, <laughs> 